sound speeds. And if you're into audio recording and or editing, then you probably heard a 32-bit floating point. But what is it exactly? Is it even necessary? Is it an absolute must? Well, in this video, I'm going to explain everything to you. But before we get going, a little disclaimer. This is going to be on the slightly technical side, but my goal isn't to lose you, it's to clarify. So I'm going to ask that if you're a professional and or already familiar with 32-bit floating point, then please give me a little creative license in my explanation. Don't worry, it'll pay off in the end. Now that said, I'm going to take it very slow and remove all distractions, including myself. Let me start by asking you a question. Using two single-digit numbers, I want you to create the largest number possible. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, and feel free to pause this video if you need additional time. Got it? Okay, write it in the comments below before continuing. Again, pause if you need to. All right, let's look at a few possibilities. If you understood the question correctly, then your two numbers would be 9 and 9. Let's try adding them together. 18. Not a very big number, so let's try multiplying them. 81. That's lower than it would be if you put the two nines together to make 99. So you might be wondering what my number is. Okay, I'll share it. 387,420,489. Did I win? Oh, you think I cheated? Okay, what if I wrote it this way then? 9 to the ninth power. The big number 9, you probably understand, but the small number 9 is what's called an exponent, or the number of times the big number is multiplied by itself. In this case, my number is the result of multiplying 9 times 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 9. Remember this because we'll come back to it in a moment. Let's talk for a moment about signal-to-noise ratio and dynamic range as it relates to sound. Signal-to-noise ratio is the amount of signal compared to the amount of noise. In a recording studio, the noise level is very low, so a recording will have a very high signal-to-noise ratio. This number in microphone specifications isn't written as a ratio like you might expect. It's actually written as a number of decibels, equating to the number 94 minus the self-noise of the microphone. So, if your microphone has 10 dB of self-noise, then you have an 84 dB signal-to-noise ratio. On the other hand, if you record in a very loud room with, let's say, a 70 dB noise floor, you don't even need to consider the self-noise of the microphone because the noise level is much higher, drowning out that self-noise. A high amount of noise in your signal anywhere equivalates to a low signal-to-noise ratio. Dynamic range is similar, but instead of subtracting the self-noise from 94, you subtract it instead from the maximum SPL, or the maximum level the microphone can take without distorting. If a microphone has a maximum SPL of 130 dB and a self-noise level of 10 dB, the dynamic range would be 120 dB. For more information, watch my video on calculating missing microphone specifications. Now let's talk about the way that sound is recorded. Analog audio from a microphone, for example, has to be converted from analog to digital so that a recorder or computer can understand it. The sound waves, or sine waves, represent a certain frequency and amplitude. Frequency is how low or high-pitched the sound is, and amplitude is the volume. The wider the sound waves are, the lower the frequency will be. Humans are usually said to be able to hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz, or 20 to 20,000 vibrations per second. At 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, sound travels at 343 meters, or 1,125 feet, per second. At that temperature, one 20 hertz sine wave is 17.15 meters long, or 56 and a half feet long. As the number of vibrations per second increases, the waves get closer together. You can easily calculate the length of a certain frequency's sine wave by dividing the distance sound can travel per second by the frequency in hertz. One 20,000 hertz sine wave would be one one thousandth as long as a 20 hertz sine wave, measuring it only 17.15 millimeters, or about two-thirds of an inch long. This is important to consider because of how the computer uses zeros and ones to represent digital sound, but before we go there, let's explain how we visually measure it. Volume is measured in decibels, or dB for short. An average speaking volume one meter away from your ear might be 76 decibels, and that same voice right next to your ear might be 96 decibels. A scream directly into your ear one inch away could be 135 decibels. Sound waves grow taller as the volume increases, and we measure this volume with an SPL meter or sound pressure level meter when we want to put it into terms that humans can measure and understand. 
Computers, on the other hand, can't hear, so saying a gunshot is 155 dB doesn't mean anything to a computer, even though in human terms, we know that would be deafening. To put things in a way that a computer can understand it, decibels become voltage, and to keep things easy, a 1000 Hz tone produces 1 volt of current at 94 decibels. That, by the way, is where the 94 dB came from in our signal-to-noise ratio calculation above. It was determined that 1 volt of current should represent maximum amplitude in digital recording, so if a signal is at its loudest, that would fill up the measuring scale. That's why digital audio metering is referred to as dBFS, or decibels relative to full scale. It should be noted that 0 dBFS represents this maximum level, and amplitudes below 0 dBFS are represented as negative numbers. As discussed in my Adding Decibels Made Simple video, every time a volume is cut in half, it decreases by 6 dB. Because decibels are logarithmic, we set our digital audio recording level to peak at negative 12 dB, and that's only 25% of the loudest volume that we can record without distorting. Computers use binary to represent information. Think of binary like a series of switches that can represent large numbers all the way down to the smallest information that a computer can comprehend, which is one bit. One switch can be flipped off, represented by a zero, or on, represented by a one, yielding two possible options. A 2-bit binary number would have four possible outcomes. Each bit added to the binary number doubles the number of possibilities. Now let's tie this into digital sound recording. A sine wave needs to be recorded as accurately as possible, and the number of bits plays a huge role in how accurately they're recorded. The number of bits available to represent the amplitude of a wave is the bit depth. The greater the number of bits, the more potential values the computer has to map out the sine wave. This process of assigning values to a wave is called quantization. If the wave falls between two values, the computer has to round up or down depending on which point it's closest to. This rounding results in inaccuracies, so the higher the bit depth, the greater the accuracy in the mapping process. That inaccuracy, by the way, is called quantization error. To reduce the amount of error, you must increase the amount of potential values, or increase bit depth. Since half of the sine wave is above this center line and half is below, the values have to be split above and below the line. Bit depth is only half of the story, though. The other half is the amount of times per second that the recording device maps out these sine waves. If you want to record audio all the way up to 20,000 Hz, the computer or recorder needs to quantize no fewer than 40,000 times per second because, remember, half of the wave is above the line and half of the wave is below the line, and each requires its own separate sample. The number of times per second that a sound wave is quantized into a value is the sample rate. If you want more information on sample rates, watch my video on this topic. Before we move on, it should be noted that each bit in the bit depth can represent about 6.021 decibels, so the highest signal-to-noise ratio in a 16-bit recording is 96.33 decibels, and in a 24-bit recording, it's 144.49 decibels, which, I might add, exceeds the maximum dynamic range of any single analog digital converter on the market at the time of this video. In real-world terms, each value mapped corresponds to the voltage of the analog signal's amplitude. Don't forget, the maximum voltage represented by a binary number is 1 volt, which equals 0 dBFS. There's no way to represent values over 0 dBFS on a digital audio meter, so when the binary numbers max out, any volume that would exceed 0 dB is represented with the highest binary value. On the meter, it would appear as a wave but with a flattened off top. This is where the term clipping comes from, because it looks like the top of the wave was clipped off with scissors. The way I just explained bit depth and sample rate is correct in fixed-point audio recording, but in floating point, it's different. While a fixed-point binary number is just a long binary word representing one value, a floating-point binary word can be broken into three parts, the 1-bit sine, the 8-bit exponent, and the 23-bit mantissa. Let's look at those in reverse. The mantissa is the base binary number that the exponent number will be multiplied by, and the sign is whether or not the binary number is positive or negative. Let's look at an example. Negative 1 times the sign value will tell you if the rest of the number is positive or negative. Next, you write 1 point, the value of the 23-bit integer. This is actually a 24-bit value, though. The 24th bit is hidden and referred to as the phantom bit. If you're wondering where it is, remember the value is 1 point, the 23-bit value, and that 1 point is the value of the phantom bit. Since it's 1, it doesn't need to be represented. 
It's important to note that the value range can only be between 1 and 9, and this decimal number is sometimes referred to as the significant. Finally, you take the value of the exponent, subtract it from 127, and then multiply 2 by 2 that number of times, the same way I did in my 9 to the 9th example at the beginning of this video. It should also be noted that 2 to the 0 power is 1. Now you should be able to calculate a 32-bit floating point value by hand. Theoretically, the dynamic range of 32-bit floating point is 1528 dB, which represents negative 758 to positive 770 decibels. This sounds incredible, and it is in many ways, but there are trade-offs. Because of the estimations and rounding of 32-bit floating numbers, they aren't as accurate as fixed-point bit words. If you're wondering how accurate 32-bit floating point is, it's exactly the same as 24-bit over the same range. This makes sense because if the sign is positive, the exponent is 2 to the 21st power, and the mantissa is a 24-bit integer, the values are the exact same. But what about outside of the 24-bit range? The simple answer is, the farther away from the 24-bit range the numbers get, the less accurate the numbers become. This is because the mantissa value is being multiplied by numbers with decimal points. Quantized values start facing small quantization errors that grow bigger as the exponent value increases. But what about negative exponent values making fractions? Wouldn't that make the precision even higher between certain ranges? Not at all, because of the quantized values or fractions, ADCs will still quantize them into whole numbers but see the decimal as error. This is because ADCs, as of the time of this video, are fixed point, so they don't even recognize fractions. It's true that these numbers are very small and represent a small fraction of a decibel, but the larger the numbers get, the less accurate they become between one value and the next. In 16 and 24-bit fixed point words, the values are even and predictable, but in 32-bit float, they fluctuate and the gaps between one value and the next vary and are unpredictable. This sometimes creates audible anomalies, like a slightly higher noise floor, but you most likely won't be able to hear it. Look at it this way, if 32-bit floating point were truly accurate, we wouldn't also have 64-bit floating point as a recording option, which produces even more accuracy and even larger values. One more note worth mentioning here. Many times, digital sound waves are represented as stair steps, but this isn't really accurate. Quantization of an analog sound wave plots a digital value as a point. People often connect those points as stair steps along a grid, and that gives us a sense of its digital nature, but in reality, it's just a tiny point that represents a value. If you were to do a lollipop graph instead, you would perhaps see these sound waves better. You may look at this and think that with random points, you could just connect the dots in any way you want, but that's where the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem comes to play. In simple terms, it establishes certain conditions a sample rate must follow when plotting a sequence of samples. This means that plot points can only be quantized one way, regardless of the frequency, and that allows you to convert the digital audio back to analog without much of a loss in quality. Sometimes distortions or artifacts do occur during this process, and this can result in one sample resembling another. This is called aliasing, and luckily it's not something that we often hear, but it is something to be aware of nonetheless. If you're familiar with digital audio, then you've no doubt been waiting for me to mention analog digital converters, or ADCs for short. An ADC is responsible for quantizing an analog audio wave into a digital representation of that wave. I go into it more and even manually demonstrate the process in my video, How Audio Compression Lowers Bit Depth. One common misconception is that ADCs will convert any audio level to digital flawlessly. This isn't the case, though. The best ADCs on the market, as of the time of this video, only have the ability to quantize about 130 decibels of dynamic range. Even then, it doesn't come for free because ADCs also have a noise floor because of how it deals with analog audio. This is important to note because in order for 32-bit float recordings to have extended dynamic range, multiple ADCs have to be used. One ADC is used similar to how one would be used for a fixed-point audio recording, and a second is used for higher audio levels. Manufacturers have different ways that they use to combine the quantized audio from both ADCs, but the big takeaway is that because two different ADCs are used, it may give you a slightly higher noise floor, but you most likely won't notice it. Not only does each ADC bring its own self-noise to the quantized audio, but since they are set at different audio levels, one higher than the other, the noise floor may even be higher. This isn't as big of a deal as it may sound like because the combination algorithm is performed with such things in mind. There may even be a DSP or digital signal processing in play to help with this process while reducing excess noise. 
The Sound Devices Mix Pre 2 series, for example, extends dynamic range all the way up to 142 decibels. That extra 12 dB over a regular 130 decibel dynamic range from a single ADC gives it the ability to record sounds four times higher because every 6 dB represents a doubling of SPL. In reality, 32-bit floating point can only represent a dynamic range between negative 130.8 dB, the lowest achievable 150 ohm EIN is at the time of this video, and 194 decibels undistorted or 210 decibels distorted. Just so it's been said, those maximums only apply to air because in other mediums like water, for example, it would be higher. As a side note, this is because sound waves are vibration, and the highest crest of a sound wave represents high pressure, while the trough of a sound wave represents low pressure. At 192 decibels, the positive pressure in air is so high that the trough of the sound wave would have to exceed a vacuum to not distort, and you can't exceed the vacuum of space, so higher than 192 decibels, and the sound wave distorts. In water, the rules are different because the trough of a 192 decibel wave isn't a vacuum. All of this considered, what's the big takeaway? If it's dead quiet, you could most likely hear the noise floor of a 16-bit bit depth audio recording, but a 24-bit bit depth, you're a lot less likely to. But what about a 32-bit bit depth? You're still limited by your analog digital converters, and while you can extend your dynamic range by using multiples, do you need that? Are you just speaking into the microphone, or are you planning to go back and forth between shooting a shotgun one foot away from the microphone and then whispering five feet away from the very same microphone? Most professionals, including those that record sound from movies and television shows, record at a 24-bit bit depth because it's plenty. It doesn't take much to set a level correctly, and with digital noise floors as low as they are, you could boost up low levels in 24-bit just as well as you can in 32-bit. But what about at higher volume levels? That is where 32-bit floating point may come in handy, but that's also why you have limiters. There are no limiters in 32-bit floating point recording because you're not going to ever get loud enough to ever need them. But in 24-bit audio, you'll potentially hit those limiters if you're recording insanely loud sounds or don't have your level set correctly. You may be tempted to record in 32-bit floating point any time you anticipate recording loud sounds, but first, look at your microphone. If you're going wireless, your sound will likely be compressed anyway, so it won't be necessary to record in 32-bit floating point. If you're hardlined, on the other hand, look at the maximum SPL of your microphone before it clips and distorts. Many condenser microphones can't handle over 130 decibels before clipping, so you might not want to record in 32-bit floating point when your microphone could clip before your analog digital converter. Are there applications where you might need 32-bit floating point? Absolutely there are. If, for example, you're recording a singer and do not have access to your recorder and have no idea if they're going to be singing loud or quietly, then you might consider it there. Maybe you're recording the subtle sounds of raindrops hitting leaves during a thunderstorm and have your gain all the way up. You might want to record in 32-bit floating point there just in case you get an incredibly loud thunderclap amongst the rainfall and you don't want to miss that. In this example or any similar scenario where you have your gain up more than normal and need to protect yourself against unexpectedly loud sounds, then 32-bit floating point could be a saving grace. But for everyday recording like podcasts, interviews, and YouTube videos, save yourself the extra large file size and just record in 24-bit. There you go, 32-bit floating point 101. Ideal for circumstances where your dynamic range is extreme and unexpectedly quiet and then loud, but completely unnecessary for most audio recordings. So feel free to go forth and record in 24-bit with confidence. But I would recommend leaving your limiter on just to be on the safe side. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Sound Speeds. Be sure to tune in the future for more deep dives, explanations, and sound advice. Have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.